the Atlanta Falcons had been dead silent for the better part of a decade. What this actually was was a period of decline brought on by meddling management, ineffective systems, and personnel decisions that broke the wrong way. All pretty standard stuff that most sports franchises experience from time to time. But what it feels like, in retrospect, is a dropping of the curtain, a shuffling around of set pieces and preparation for the act to follow. The Falcons had a big identity change thanks to one very specific addition. In the 1989 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons used the fifth overall pick on a 21-year-old franchise-changing athlete out of Florida State, a revolutionary cornerback who could impact football games more than any other corner ever has before or since. Dion had never played the position before college, but by the time he left Tallahassee, scouts had never seen such a talented corner. And he knew exactly how great he was, consistently carrying around both massive amounts of swagger and massive amounts of jewelry. Even better, despite the fact that Atlanta had been in the doldrums and was coming off six straight losing seasons, he really embraced the idea of becoming a Falcon. He envisioned getting the credit for being the one to turn their fortunes around. One thing that complicated matters, however, was another sport. A talented baseball outfielder, Dion had been drafted the previous year by the New York Yankees, and when the Falcons weren't meeting his contractual demands, he held out from Atlanta's training camp and threatened to turn his attention full-time to baseball, where he'd been called up to the big leagues. Just a few days before the NFL season started, right in the middle of a baseball game against the Mariners, the Falcons finally were able to bring their prized draft pick to Atlanta to begin his extraordinary NFL career. There was so much that went into making Deion Sanders the greatest, most impactful cornerback in NFL history, that went into making him one of a kind at so many things, that went into making him primetime. The obvious place to start, just because it was the thing that most jumped off the screen at you, was his unmatched athleticism and raw talent. His pure speed was nothing short of cartoonish, which made him an absolute nightmare to try and corral in open space whenever he had the ball in his hands, whether it was after picking off a pass and zooming the other way until he's high-stepping into the end zone, or, as illustrated by this punt return, just five minutes into his NFL career, his game-changing explosiveness returning punts and kicks, or even dabbling in some wide receiver where he could take a short pass to the house in the blink of an eye. Despite all those physical gifts, Dion still wouldn't have been nearly the cornerback he was if he hadn't had a brilliant football mind and tremendous work ethic to go along with him. He relentlessly studied opposing receivers and their splits and footwork and habits and tells to the point that he basically always knew what route the guy lining up across from him was gonna run. Plenty of cornerbacks make educated gambles based on what they expect through their film study, but what made Dion the the top cover corner of all time was that with him, there was no such thing as a gamble because gambling implies there's the potential to lose. That potential didn't really exist with Dion. He could squat and jump on shorter routes because even in the rare times he guessed wrong or took a false step and the receiver went deep, Dion's preternatural makeup speed would never leave him out of position to recover and make a play on the ball. He was also an expert at baiting quarterbacks. Even against a Canton-bound duo here, Dion dupes Steve Young into thinking he's got Jerry Rice wide open for an easy scoring pitch and catch. Uh-uh. It got to the point where opponents simply never even bothered throwing it to his side of the field. And while the term shutdown corner gets thrown around often, Deion Sanders was the one true bona fide shutdown corner in NFL history. The only player with the smarts, size, instincts, anticipation, and athleticism to legitimately wipe away an entire side of the field from the offense's attack. There's no denying Deion's talents as a shutdown corner and the amount of swag he brought to the game. But it's just so silly how he possessed both traits at such a high level. The dude was just so effortlessly cool. 
He'll show up with his chain swinging and Jerry Carroll juice flying everywhere just to shut down your team's top receiver. And there was nothing you could do about it. Anyone who has the confidence to say, if you look good, you feel good. If you feel good, you play good. If you play good, they pay good. And turn around to prove every single word of that is just legendary. That type of brash confidence with the ability to back it up is why Dion meant so much to Atlanta. In a city where so many folks consider themselves trendsetters, Dion was there solidifying himself as someone the NFL had never seen before. He might have left and had more team success with other squads, but he came into this league as an Atlanta Falcon, and he was proud of it from day one. He was the first true superstar for a franchise that rarely had a lot to celebrate. Of course, Dion later became an Atlanta Brave too, suiting up for Bobby Cox's National League champs from 1991 to 94. A lot has been made about Dion's simultaneous baseball and football exploits, and for good reason. We could spend an hour talking about it, but let's stop just long enough to show you this. On September 25, 1991, while playing for the Braves, Dion Sanders stole second base. Let's move about 40 yards up and to the left. On this spot, just three days prior, Dion Sanders registered a sack fumble on Raiders quarterback Jay Schrader. Two completely different acts of thievery. That's what he was best at. There are so many dead bolts on this achievement that prevent it from ever being repeated. First, you have to be active on an NFL roster and an MLB roster at the same time, which only Dion has ever done. Second, both teams need to play on the same field in the same week, which requires a multi-purpose stadium, which the NFL and MLB don't do at all anymore. Third, you must record both a stolen base and a sack, two things that are associated with two very, very different body types. Dion did something on this spot that will never, ever happen again. Anyway, this patch of land is a parking lot now. If you want to find it, you can make your way to the green lot somewhere to the left of marker number seven. Can't miss it. The Falcons had always had their fair share of characters, but they were mostly found in dignified elder statesmen like Jeff Van Note and Claude Humphrey, born-again golden boys like Steve Barkowski and Greg Brezina, and the Archie Bunker magic of Norm Van Brocklin. Now they had both of the largest, loudest personalities in pro football. One was Dion, a person who offered a specific type of presence that the big four American sports had never really seen before. The other was an old friend. In his first stop in Atlanta, Jerry Glanville had made NFL history by being the only man in football willing to push every single faucet on the soda fountain, sending a tasteless number of pass rushers after the quarterback, and producing the most stringent defense the NFL has ever seen. Yeah, it was only effective for one season until opposing offensive coordinators figured out how to solve for it. Who cares? Point is, Glanville wasn't afraid to stand out. In fact, he loved it. After leaving the Falcons in 1982, Glanville eventually won the head coaching job with the Houston Oilers and quickly built a reputation as one of the most obnoxious guys in pro football. He held some qualities reminiscent of another old friend, Van Brocklin. For instance, like Van Brocklin, he wanted to physically fight the media, once offering to go one-on-one -on -one with a radio host in a Rage in the Cage style motel room deathmatch until only one was left standing. After leading the Oilers to three straight playoff appearances, Glanville landed the top job in Atlanta, where he tried even harder and looked even less cool. He was the damn Gandalf of the Piedmont, leaving Atlanta to battle the Balrog and returning in a majestic cloak. Glanville was known as the Man in Black, which is something you want other people to call you when you're five. And in an effort to rebrand as the bad boys of the NFC, he had the Falcons uniforms redesigned to an all-black pattern. I'm partial to the red helmets, but I, I gotta admit, they're pretty cool. Glantville is probably best remembered for occasionally buying game tickets for Elvis and leaving them for pickup at the Will Call booth. If he had done this quietly, and the story came to light years after the fact, this would have been a very funny goof. An all-timer. Instead, though, he wrung every last ounce of humor out of it. He tore all around town with Elvis vanity plates on his Corvette. He titled his autobiography, Elvis Don't Like Football. He put his name on the Genesis and Super Nintendo game, Jerry Glanville's Pigskin Footbrawl, a side-scroller that resembles Streets of Rage more than any football game and actually looks pretty fun. At the end of each stage, you're treated to a black and white bitmap that probably took up half the memory in the cartridge of Glanville looking very, very cool, as well as a rundown of your stats. One of them is Elvis sightings. This joke is trying so, so hard. I'm exhausted. 
As a comedian, he had a lot of trouble with the follow-through. On one occasion, he accused an official of calling a game against him and said, here, might as well steal my watch too, and threw it at him. The official called his bluff, picked up the watch, and walked away. That's the joke, man. It's done. This joke cost you 15,000 bucks and now it's over. But as any comedian will tell you, the best jokes always end with, wait, wait, I was just joking. So yeah, Jerry Glanville was corny. But he was also a genuinely interesting, entertaining personality with a similarly entertaining system. The NFL could use more of that. At the top of Glanville's initial wish list was hiring June Jones as his offensive coordinator. Jones was a reserve quarterback on the Falcons when Glanville was concocting the Grits Blitz during his first stint on Atlanta's coaching staff. Jones leaned on Glanville during those years to learn more about defense, and then Glanville hired Jones to coach his quarterbacks for a couple years in Houston. Unfortunately for Glanville, Jones's employer put the kibosh on any attempts to poach him. After the Falcons struggled through a 5-11 season in 1990, Jones's contract expired and Glanville finally got his man and the innovative offensive system that came along with him. Previously, the Falcons under Jerry Glanville had been running an offense he called the Red Gun, but was more widely known as the Run and Shoot offense. Thus, you can understand the strong desire to reunite with Jones, a run and shoot guru who evolved and put his own spin on the offense developed by Jones's former college coach, Mouse Davis. It was a pass-heavy offense that spread the field with four wide receivers and just one running back pretty much every play, with the tight end essentially extinct in this offense. Generally, there'd be a receiver split wide on each side, and a slot receiver on each side lined up tight to the formation, though sometimes there could be a trips look with three wide receivers lined up on the same side of the field. A key tenet of the system is that whereas receivers often have a predetermined route that they're assigned to run, the run and shoot is predicated on adjusting after the snap to whatever the defense's coverage scheme is. For example, when facing a zone defense, the quarterback and receiver have to be on the same page in identifying who's going to occupy which zone and reacting accordingly to find the soft spots in that zone. When firing on all cylinders, there should be post-snap built-in counters for anything the defense can possibly throw at them. It placed heavy stress on the defense and demanded that they cover every blade of grass on the field. Some of the downsides are that it's a one-dimensional offense and that it provides minimal protection for the quarterback. Therefore, they usually roll out after taking the snap instead of dropping back because they're very exposed to the pass rush, and with anything other than lightning quick decision making, they're a sitting duck back there. As for who would be the long term quarterback to sling the ball around in Jones's run and shoot, the Falcons had some decisions to make when the 1991 NFL draft rolled around. The Falcons didn't have an urgent need at the position, as starter Chris Miller had given them steady play there, but by 91, they were at least sniffing around QBs. And lead personnel exec Ken Harrock was specifically drawn to the aroma about 400 miles southwest in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and a prospect entering that year's draft by the name of Brett Favre. The star quarterback from the University of Southern Miss was coming off a turbulent year. In the summer before his senior season, a car wreck nearly killed him, and while it eventually necessitated the removal of two and a half feet of his intestine, he returned after just a month to lead a resounding victory over an SEC powerhouse. After capping his standout career by leading the Golden Eagles to an eight-win season, Favre was widely expected to be the first quarterback selected, potentially even in the top 15 picks, with Harrock's Falcons showing heavy interest. And with that extra first round pick at number 13 overall conveniently in their back pocket, that's where Favre's camp expected him to land. But they got thrown a curveball when Atlanta instead chose a slot receiver with that 13th pick. The spot he thought was earmarked all along for him was not to be, so Favre went back to playing Nintendo while somehow remaining on the board all the way until the Falcons' next pick, where finally they pounced. But make no mistake, this was a Ken Harrock pick all the way. Glanville wanted someone else, and never liked Favre from day one, once even remarking it'd take a plane crash to play him. 
completely turned off by the partying ways of his top prospect that they were quite fortunate to have dropped to them at pick 33, Glanville wouldn't even learn Favre's name, opting instead for a far more verbally inefficient route and refused to install him as his backup quarterback, forcing Harrock to trade for deposed charger Billy Joe Tolliver just a few days before the season kicked off. Favre also admittedly did very little to help his own cause. That nightlife reputation was the reason his teammates gave him their own moniker. He blew off game plans, slept in meetings, and when the third stringer did receive his scant playing time in 1991, it couldn't have gone worse. Mopping up a blowout loss in Washington, he turned his only five dropbacks of the season into two completions to the opposition, zero completions to a teammate, and a sack. Just a couple weeks later, developments were unfolding up in Green Bay, with the Packers looking to shake up their football operation in the midst of their 18th playoff list season in 19 years. And in late November, they plucked Ron Wolf out of the Jets' front office to be their new general manager. Like Harrock, Wolf was enamored with Favre when he was coming out of college and was the most coveted player on his team's board. With frantic efforts to trade up nearly resulting in a deal with Phoenix before the Cardinals reneged at the last second, Harrock landed Favre just one spot before Wolf was poised to. Wolf was also a close friend and former colleague of Harrock's, and wouldn't you know it, Wolf's first game running the Packers just so happened to come a few days later in Atlanta against his old pal. Well before the game started, Harrock encouraged Wolf to check out Favre's throw, signaling he was receptive to offers for a player he knew would never get a fair shake from the coaching staff. Wolf took him up on the offer, which rubber-stamped his burning desire to acquire the young gunslinger for his new team in Green Bay. After the season, Harrock orchestrated a meeting with Glanville, June Jones, and team ownership to develop a plan as to how to handle Favre's status amid their difference of opinion. But the available evidence began to sow doubt in Harrock's head. After he initially attached an unrealistic price tag to Favre, Wolf moved forward with an opening counteroffer of a second round pick. Harrock stood firm on a first round pick, though he hoped that would prove too expensive. It wasn't. They eventually kissed on the Venn diagram in February 1992 on a deal for Favre, who when notified of the trade, thought it was interesting, but not as interesting as finishing his crawfish. And when Favre's first career start on the road happened to be in Atlanta, he made crystal clear there was no love lost with Glanville. At the time of the trade, the Falcons' rationale was understandable. They had a quarterback who rode the run and shoot to the Pro Bowl, so Favre wasn't going to be playing in the immediate future anyway, and they rebounded in year two of the Glanville regime to become a playoff team, so their window to contend was open. That draft pick could have been used on someone who actually played and helped take them to the next level. Unfortunately, they ultimately used that mid-first round pick to draft a Southern Miss teammate of Favre's, running back Tony Smith. It was a pick that did not pan out. Looking back, it seems really strange that Glanville didn't enjoy the spectacle that Favre brought along with him, because he loved every single other kind of spectacle. The NFL had instituted rules restricting non-football-related personnel from loitering on the sidelines just in time for the Falcons to completely ignore them. Celebrities were a common sight on the Atlanta sideline. Cobb County's own Travis Tritt was a regular, and he and Glanville were commonly seen hanging out around town. Other luminaries, such as Wayne Newton and James Brown, were spotted from time to time. But above all, the Falcons' spiritual leader and muse was M.C. Hammer. Hammer and the Falcons had become fast friends following their appearance in Hammer's Too Legit to Quit music video. If you want to find Glanville in this video, you gotta do a little skipping around. Toward the very end, Jerry gets exactly 1.8 seconds of fame, just long enough to say Too Legit to Quit. Got all dressed up just for that. 
Sorry, Jerry. Regardless, Glanville and the Falcons made sure he was a regular presence. Dion credited Hammer as an inspiration for his 100-yard kickoff return against San Francisco. In tribute, he high-stepped throughout the entire second half of the run. In this confluence of NFL, hip-hop, and the city of Atlanta, we saw the beginnings of three things that, while already big, were about to explode in popularity and help define American culture. In particular, though, Hammer and the Falcons were an interesting contrast. The Falcons were resented by their peers for an attitude and style of play that opponents found dirty. Hammer, on the other hand, was mocked by rappers on both coasts for being clean and marketable. While others resented the Falcons' unorthodox way of doing business, Hammer was criticized for borrowing from others by sampling. But Hammer was a representation of what was to come in hip-hop. Today, sampling is a celebrated art, and relatively clean rappers have found universal appeal. Not so with the Jerry Glanville Falcons. In today's NFL, sure, there are fun teams and interesting people. But teams with this kind of attitude are nowhere to be found. Not anymore. Jerry and Dion had a lot in common. Both were iconoclasts, both sought attention at every opportunity, and yet we're painting Dion as an inherently cool dude and Jerry is just kind of a dork. Why? Well, lots of reasons, but I'll name four. First, takes one to no one. Second, Dion possessed one of the most varied and fascinating skill sets of any athlete who has ever lived, whereas Glanville dressed like two eight-year-olds poorly conceived plot to sneak into showgirls. Third, Dion was expressing himself as an athlete, and throughout history, athletes were typically discouraged from expressing themselves. They'd made owners rich, not themselves, and now they were starting to claim that power. That's what Dion represented. Jerry, meanwhile, wow, a loud boss, huh? That's crazy, man. And fourth, Dion understood the art of comedy. In 92, baseball broadcaster Tim McCarver used his national pulpit to criticize Dion for simultaneously playing football and baseball. He didn't have Tim McCarver's permission to do that, and McCarver sternly voiced his disapproval to millions on multiple occasions. Dion responded brilliantly. When McCarver was in the Braves clubhouse the night they won the National League pennant, Dion snuck up behind him and gave him a bath. When McCarver, who never imagined he'd face any consequences for trashing a guy for having two jobs on national television, tried to scold him, hey, I got a real man, man, you know that? Dion gave him another. This is Three Stooges stuff. It's comedy at its very most fundamental. Even if Jerry didn't quite have it in him to achieve that level of comedy himself, he should be commended for enabling it. In fact, I think he deserves substantial credit for one of the funniest, most disrespectful stunts ever seen on a football field because only a Jerry Glanville team would be brazen enough to even think of it. Over the previous five years or so, something startling had happened. The New Orleans Saints had gotten good. As recently as the mid-80s, the Saints had found a way to lose about twice as many games as the Falcons over their respective lifetimes. Unlike the Falcons, they'd never fielded any contenders. For more than 20 years in New Orleans, it had been nothing but losing all the way down. But led by head coach Jim Mora and Baton Rouge-born quarterback Bobby Hebert, the Saints dramatically reversed course, to the point at which they actually had a better overall record than Atlanta. They'd made two playoff appearances, something that even a short time ago seemed impossible. And in 91, they made a third trip to the postseason, where, in the first round, they ran into the Atlanta Falcons. We're going to spoil a couple of very important details right away. First, as the chart indicates here, the Falcons will win this game. Second, to this day, all the way up through 2020, this is the one and only time the Falcons and Saints ever met in the playoffs. Some might take this to mean that this is an ultimately meaningless rivalry. But given the half century of madness between these two that has never once relented, I'd argue exactly the opposite. But these considerations really only set the stage for what happens on December 28th, 1991. You just have to see it for yourself. Their playoff showdown starts wonderfully for Atlanta as Glanville's defense forces what should have been a three and out before a reckless roughing the kicker call brings them back in. That leads to Floyd Turner capitalizing on a miscommunication by the Falcons secondary to break wide open for the score and a 7-0 Saints lead. With New Orleans on the doorstep of the goal line and threatening to go up 14 the next time they get the ball, Dion knows that rookie receiver Wesley Carroll is going to be running a slant, baits the throw, 
and then explodes through the optical illusion he created of an open passing window to snag the interception and put out that fire. Midway through the second quarter, with the Falcons trailing 10-zip, running back Mike Rozier takes a handoff up the middle and gets immediately stuffed, with the ball ripped away from him and the Saints recovering. Despite his right knee clearly not being down when the ball popped out, and his left knee clearly not being down when the ball popped out, the official on the left, who blew the play dead, won out against the official on the right. Next play, on third and long, the Falcons parlay their good fortune into a touchdown when Chris Miller finds Andre Risen shaking free to bring Atlanta within three. After the teams traded a couple field goals, the Saints are set to kick off with just three seconds left in the first half. Falcons linebacker Michael Reed falls on the little squib kick and then inexplicably chucks it backward in an apparent attempt to spark some sort of spectacular touchdown. The Saints happen to be offsides on the play, so let's give Reed the benefit of the doubt that perhaps he saw the flag or something and knew it was going to be a free play. Okay, fine. In that case, that'd be reasonable then. On to the re-kick. Okay, so I guess that initial one wasn't simply a product of the penalty. No longer even possessing the element of surprise in a plan fraught with risk, they wanted to get the ball in Deion Sanders' hands because there's no one in the world more likely than him to pull a rabbit out of the hat and weave his way into the end zone. Except for the fact that there's still an exponentially higher chance of just handing your opponent a touchdown via lateral gone awry, as was nearly the case here. So while an upside did exist in which the Falcons could have scored and entered halftime up four, that wasn't nearly as likely as the downside of entering halftime down ten. Having dodged that bullet to remain down three, Atlanta comes out firing to open the second half, capping an 84-yard drive with Miller dropping this beauty right in the bucket for Michael Haynes, who makes a magnificent catch after getting a half step on the cornerback manages to stay in bounds and hangs on to the ball even though he knows the safety's about to lay a wallop on him. Their first lead is short-lived, however. It looks like they've held the Saints to just a field goal, but a Falcons encroachment means once again a special teams penalty sends Atlanta's defense back on the field. And once again, New Orleans takes advantage to take the lead back before some more Dion-based lateraling on the ensuing kickoff. With under three minutes left in the game, the Falcons have the ball with the score tied. The Saints dial up a heavy blitz, and with Haynes being given a sizable cushion by the cornerback, his job is to run a 10-yard hitch. After a quick inside move and a broken tackle, it is a foot race. And the New Orleans native doesn't lose many of those, which nearly turns out the lights on his favorite childhood team's season. But there's still one flicker remaining, one last chance for the Saints to try and force overtime. New Orleans is able to advance down to Atlanta's 35-yard line with 70 seconds left. On the next play, Falcons cornerback Tim McHire, playing a zone defense, is just sitting on the quick out route. Interception. Game. Clinched. The Saints don't have enough timeouts to make a stop and get the ball back. What you do in this moment if you're the Falcons, if you're Tim McHire, is immediately hit the ground. Give yourself up. In the play. The game is over. It can safely be argued that this is the single biggest win to date in the Atlanta Falcons' 26-year history. Their only other playoff win came all the way back in 1978 against the Eagles. But this one comes against their arch rival. And if they win this, it'll represent the end of a slide that's lasted nearly a decade. All that needs to happen is for McHire to hit the deck. Saints receiver Floyd Turner recognizes that this thing is sewn up and peels away instead of making the hit. <laughs> Uh-oh. McHire's not going down, but he's not going upfield either. He's looking for an accomplice. He's looking for Dion. 
Dion always liked to joke about becoming a three-sport athlete and playing rugby, a distant cousin of football that heavily emphasizes short pitches to teammates. The Falcons love doing this. Throughout this season, they found a little bit of success tossing laterals here and there, and as we just saw, their attempt to do so in this very game almost ended in catastrophe. But here they are, taking us on another terrifying roller coaster with nothing to gain and absolutely everything to lose. Makaira finds Dion, who hits all four directions on the D-pad before sprinting upfield. The sideline is right there. The Saints have him walled off. Surely now Dion is going to step out of bounds and win the ball game. No, he has sorcery to perform. Watch his number 89, Quinn Early, goes for the stop. Dion shakes him so badly that by the time he's done with him, Quinn Early has been demoted. He is now number 68. Look again. 89, 68. 68 is essentially an upside down 89. What's likely here is that Quinn Early, who was previously seen in this game wearing correct numbers on the front and back, probably had to change at some point into a backup jersey with messed up upside down lettering. That is the rational explanation. But the correct explanation is that Deion Sanders is a sorcerer and he's not finished conjuring. He now pitches to rookie Joe Fishback, who takes it all the way to the house for a completely unnecessary touchdown. This score was later overturned and correctly so. Laterals can't even be a fraction of a degree forward, and we can see that Dion lets it go just before the 40-yard line and Fishback grabs it just after the 40. The Falcons took a knee after this and won by one touchdown instead of two. I think this is the reason the play is mostly forgotten today. But a play like this with multiple laterals is only ever seen if a team is losing in the final seconds. It's a desperation play. The Falcons appear to be in a state of urgency to the point of panic. The difference here is that the Falcons were not desperate to avoid a loss. The Falcons were desperate to beat the Saints even worse. Atlanta was decisively knocked out of the playoffs a week later in Washington, but that seems beside the point entirely. This, this game, was their Super Bowl. In the 55-year history of this rivalry, this remains the one and only time the Falcons and Saints squared off in playoff football. And the goal wasn't simply to win, it was to punk him the fuck out. It was a testament to Deion Sanders' athleticism, spectacular personality, and determination to thoroughly destroy his opponent. But in equal measure, it revealed the unique character of these Atlanta Falcons, who never would have even tried this if they had been led by anyone other than Jerry Glanville. Any other coach would have been absolutely driven up a wall by such a useless stunt that could have lost them a playoff game. Jerry just kind of chuckled conceding only that it was a little bit extreme and acknowledging that it was fully in line with the outlandish philosophy he himself had implemented, before excusing himself to join one of many locker room dance parties with Hammer. This was their greatest moment. After the Falcons finished with 6-10 records in each of their next two seasons, Jerry Glanville was fired. Despite the presence of Deion Sanders, their defense regressed to the worst in the NFL, and after an agonizing, protracted series of negotiations, Deion finally left for the Niners after the 1993 season. And after a startling rebrand as a gangster rapper that convinced absolutely nobody on earth, Hammer Celebrity faded as well. Nothing this weird and electrifying is allowed to last for long. You can say whatever you want about these Jerry Glanville, Deion Sanders, MC Hammer Falcons, but they put something into the NFL that the game had never seen before, and that we have never seen since. I mean, good lord. This is the rudest thing I have ever seen on an NFL field. It's a work of art. Imagine giving the city of Baltimore 10 years to add everybody in Memphis. That's more or less what Atlanta was dealing with in the 90s, and the infrastructure just wasn't ready for it. My elementary school had to repurpose janitor's closets as classrooms to get out of the room the kids would have to crawl over the desks. It took a million years to get anywhere. You'd spend hours just baking in the car, sitting in gridlock on a two-lane highway that needed to be eight lanes. I've never seen anything like it since. Endless stucco in every direction. The only grass you'd see for miles was this weird Bermuda grass that they trucked in on pallets that turned yellow in the fall. But if there's any one site that defines the Georgia aesthetic over the last 30 years, it's this stuff. Romans left the aqueducts. Georgians left silt fences. Black plastic silt fences, held in by wooden stakes to keep piles of red Georgia clay from spilling out of bulldozed plots of land. There must have been 100,000 miles of it strung around metro Atlanta. It was like an entire city was being built at the same time. 
The Falcons were outgrowing their home too. In Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, they didn't get the favorable financial conditions the Braves did, despite both teams being the same age. And getting sacked somewhere around second base stopped being funny after a while. As is standard practice in American sports, owner Rankin Smith threatened to move the Falcons to Jacksonville if a new stadium wasn't built. And it worked. Open in 1992, the 71,000-seat Georgia Dome received a large chunk of its funding from a hotel-motel tax that visitors to Atlanta would see on their hotel bills. I mean, hey, if the rest of the country was planning on coming to Atlanta and beating the Falcons' asses like they'd spent the last 25 years doing, paying for the venue was, honestly, the least they could do. When Dion made his first trip to the Georgia Dome as a visitor, there was much fanfare in the lead-up surrounding his individual matchup with Andre Risen. The two had quite a lengthy history. First in college, they had some bad blood stemming from a couple heated battles in 1987 and 88 when Ryzen's Michigan State Spartans faced Sanders' Seminoles, the latter of which featured some fisticuffs between the two. He and Dion spent four years not just as teammates, but they were also roommates. Now they're once again opponents ready to go after each other. And early in the second quarter, Dion greeted Ryzen with a poke to his eye. A couple plays later, the old friends fully committed to catching up and exchanging pleasantries with one another. The very next time Atlanta got the ball, Dion ended their scoring threat with a flair unique only to primetime, saying hello to his old sideline as he high-stepped his way to an insurmountable 28-3 lead. That exuberance came with a groin injury that knocked him out the rest of the game. I think we can safely say that it was worth it. The Falcons of the early 90s loved attention and often got it. They were indeed the self-styled bad boys of the NFL. But one person in the Falcons' orbit stood alone as a true iconoclast. Lisa Left Eye Lopez emerged as a musical prodigy while growing up in Philly, and she was drawn to Atlanta by its burgeoning rap and R&B scene. Soon after, she became one-third of TLC, one of the most influential groups of any genre in the last few decades. Lopez began dating Andre Risen. About a year into their relationship, Risen allegedly assaulted her one morning in an Atlanta Kroger. Ultimately, prosecutors dismissed the charges, explaining that key witnesses had given inconsistent accounts of the incident. If there's one thing the NFL's known for, it's putting its head in the sand and pretending problems don't exist. One has been the high rate of assault and domestic violence committed by its players. If you're a star, there will be the standard incantations of personal problems and overcoming adversity and you'll be let back in. If you're a really big star, it might just be swept under the rug entirely. In Ryzen's case, the allegations alone were more than enough to convince his sponsors to pull ads and cut ties with him. Similarly, it was well within the power of both the Falcons and the NFL to take any action they felt appropriate, but Ryzen wasn't suspended for a single game. In these moments, the NFL tells us a lot about them. Lopez would later become perhaps the first woman ever to dominate the NFL news cycle when, after one of many arguments with Ryzen, she dumped some gifts in the marble bathtub of his house and lit him on fire. Crucially though, after the ensuing damage, it was replaced with a plastic tub. Perhaps unaware of this, Lopez did the same with Ryzen's shoe collection sometime later. The plastic melted, and the mansion went up in flames. This was all Atlanta news media talked about for days. Helicopter footage of the ruins was all you saw on every channel. To many football fans, Left Eye's legacy is simply crazy lady who burned a house down. But here was a woman who, on top of her groundbreaking talents that helped put Atlanta's R&B scene on the map, was a true cultural dissident. No one was supposed to be sex positive then, least of all a black woman in the South. But she got her nickname by wearing a condom over her right eye, a statement that was part of her advocacy for birth control. To these Atlanta Falcons, I mean, their definition of iconoclasm was wearing all black uniforms without league approval and allowing unauthorized famous guys on the sidelines. How much more than that you should really expect out of a football team, I don't know. The fact remains that these guys couldn't, or more accurately wouldn't, meaningfully transcend the little painted rectangle they played in. Within that rectangle, it was probably pretty easy to feel like revolutionaries. But what the Falcons thought they were, Left Eye actually was.
For better or for worse, the Smith family that owned and operated the Falcons had a habit of filling the head coaching position with guys they remembered from the 70s. They rehired Marion Campbell a decade after they fired him. They brought back Jerry Glanville a decade after his first stint in Atlanta. And in 94, they elevated June Jones, once their backup quarterback, to head coach. At this point, the Falcons ran the only pure run and shoot offense in the NFL. And Jones's first job was to find the quarterback who could actually fly this thing. Having traded away Brett Favre, the Falcons had spent the 90s making do with a platoon of Chris Miller, Billy Joe Tolliver, and fan favorite Bobby Hebert, who they'd signed away from the Saints. To lock down their quarterback of the future, they bundled together a handful of draft picks, shipped him off to Indianapolis, and landed former number one overall pick, Jeff George. George was kind of a project. His career in Indianapolis was defined by poor numbers, lots of losing, and one of the most unique holdouts ever seen, in which George didn't really even ask for anything or say why he was holding out. I guess he just didn't want to play football. I get it, man. But when he returned, his potential came with him, and his stock rose enough in 93 for the Falcons to go after him. Their gamble paid off. George thrived in the run and shoot and he established himself as one of the league's more effective passers. He benefited from the talents of receivers Eric Metcalf, Bert Emanuel, and Terrence Mathis, all three of whom surpassed 1,000 yards in 1995. But his secret weapon was in the backfield with him. If you're running a formation that doesn't give you two running backs, what's the next best thing? How about one enormous running back? The single back in June Jones's run and shoot for a couple years was the domain of Craig Ironhead Hayward, a free agent they initially signed to back up Eric Pegram. But five games into the 94 season, with Ironhead averaging over a yard and a half more per carry than Pegram, the former supplanted the latter as starter following a deliciously scoregomic win. Ironhead was a perfect fit for Jones's offense. Though he'd previously had some well-documented struggles with his weight earlier in his career, sometimes registering three spins on the scale, in Atlanta he got that under control, and at peak condition, he was built like the offspring of a semi-truck and a bowling ball, while possessing surprising quickness and ability to make plays catching the ball out of the backfield, where he could get loose out in space and rumble upfield like a rolling ball of butcher knives for big gains. He also absolutely flourished in pass protection, dominating even decorated D linemen. He'd stonewall you, knock your helmet off, then kick that shit away and let you hear about it. And while the Falcons ran the ball way less than everyone else every year June Jones was head coach, when they did keep it on the ground, they thoroughly pounded defenses. Their opponent often lined up with a light box featuring just one linebacker in a dime defense with six defensive backs sprayed all over the field to match up with the four Falcon wideouts. For Ironhead, that was taking candy from a baby other than Maggie Simpson. He was the hammer to those poor little human DB nails who were often giving up 50 plus pounds in their collisions. In 1995, despite not carrying the ball as much as a lot of his running back brethren in more traditional offenses, because his yardage per carry was alongside some all-time greats near the top of that year's leaderboard, he was still able to rush for nearly 1,100 yards, which helped earn him an invitation to the Pro Bowl to cap that memorable season. A little over 10 years later, Hayward tragically passed away from a recurring brain tumor at just 39 years old. And while his son Cam has carved out one hell of a career himself up in Pittsburgh, the Hayward name will also always have a strong legacy in Atlanta, where Ironhead will be forever beloved. None of the June Jones Falcons teams set the NFL on fire, but they do claw themselves to an 8-7 record entering the last game of the 95 season. Their old roommates, the Braves, have just brought the first ever championship to Atlanta. And hey, maybe the Falcons can make some magic too. They can lock in a playoff spot with one more win, but that win will have to come against the defending Super Bowl champion 49ers. The Niners are in the thick of a dynasty that just will not end. Future Hall of Famer Joe Montana spent most of the 80s beating on the Falcons, and then future Hall of Famer Steve Young showed up and beat him up some more. Along with the Cowboys, the 49ers were NFL royalty. 
And just like the Cowboys who knocked the Falcons out of the playoffs in 1978 and 1980, it was now the Niners' job to get these punks off the lawn. Down 21-10, everything feels hopeless after Jeff George gets planted into the Georgia Dome turf. I sat on it one time while attending a Billy Graham crusade and I can confirm that that shit was not comfortable. George is knocked out in favor of Bobby Hebert, who stuck around as a backup after George took his starting job. There have been a lot of Falcons fans who preferred Hebert all along. Even the Niners felt the need to stick their thumb in it, with defensive end Ricky Jackson just coming out and saying that Bobby Hebert was a great quarterback and Jeff George was a guy they weren't scared of. This Christmas Eve, everyone in the house was pulling for Bobby, and Bobby played Santa Claus. First down the chimney was a touchdown strike to Terrence Mathis in the back of the end zone that briefly gave the Falcons the lead. Then, down once again in the final minutes, Hebert converts a 4th and 5 by staying cool in the pocket and finding Metcalf to keep hopes alive. The next play is not as fortunate. The pocket collapses and forces him out. In this instant, it has to be tempting to roll all the way out, pick up a few yards, and step out of bounds. After all, it's first down and there's still about 2 minutes on the clock. That would be the smart play, unless you're capable of this. With defenders all around Terrence Mathis, he finds him deep. Mathis, like Bear, wants to eat the entire thing in one bite. He stiff arms Eric Davis, stiff arms Dedrick Dodge, sticks the ball out, and crash lands into the end zone, giving Atlanta a 28-27 lead. The 49ers have no answer on their final possession. Ball game. Fans understandably clamored for Bobby Bear to start. This was a little bit unfair to George, who'd assembled four game-winning drives that season, had pretty good numbers, and was playing pretty well before he was knocked out. Without much of a second thought, Jones stuck with George. In retrospect, though, probably wouldn't have mattered. Because the following week, the Falcons were up against a quarterback who was in a different class entirely. Brett Favre bombed the Falcons secondary with three touchdown passes, and his Packers won 37-20 in a game that never felt close. Atlanta Journal-Constitution columnist Steve Hummer captured the feeling well. Who were these Falcons? Nobody knows, and now they're gone. It felt like the end, he said, and he was right. A year later, Brett Favre would lead the Packers to the Super Bowl win the Falcons had spent three decades chasing. What's most tragic is that Favre didn't come from nowhere. He wasn't a diamond in the rough, he didn't have to go to Green Bay to learn how to be great. His talents were known. The explanation Jerry Glanville would later give is that Favre couldn't stay sober, and implied that he intentionally did him a favor by sending him to Green Bay to shape up. Yes, Jerry, Wisconsin, the state where famously no one ever drinks alcohol. Glanville just got it wrong. In one of the most consequential misjudgments of talent in NFL history, he failed to see that in Favre, an eventual three-time MVP and no doubt Hall of Famer, he had one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Once again, it's tempting to imagine how different this team's history might have been. The Niners and Cowboys would soon give way to new powers, one being Brett Favre's Packers. The window was open for the Falcons, and they missed it. These were the team's wildest years yet, but the Atlanta Falcons were only beginning to demonstrate their ability to astound in one direction or another, for one reason or another. Through alternating stabilizations and free falls, they'd finished drawing the arc of the wing. It was now time to trace the rest of it. But it's the evening out that's always the most complicated. <laughs> 